Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the uh, next in the series of the Wigner Lectures. Um, we're going to be recording this, this lecture, uh, but not streaming it, so you'll be able to look at it uh, later if there's this stuff you want to uh, review to understand. Just a quick reminder about the, the origins of this lecture series. It was initiated on the 70th anniversary of the criticality of the graphite reactor um, and is, is named uh, in honor of Eugene Wigner, who uh, trained as a chemical engineer, was awarded a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963 for his contributions to atomic theory and the role of symmetry, uh, founded the field of nuclear engineering, and was really a role model uh, for the coupling of basic and applied work, and, and in his role as research director of Oak Ridge National Lab, then Clinton Labs in the mid-40s, right after the Second World War, really developed the blueprint for what became ORNL. Uh, the series is organized by our corporate fellows, and the goal is to invigorate scientific discovery, spur technological innovation, and initiate productive scientific policy debate. And I think you've seen over the last... Uh, 13 months or so, we've had a very varied group of speakers who come at those three goals from, from different angles. Um, and uh, the uh, interesting link, I think, to today's theme is, uh, you know, th following on from Wigner's uh, role as research director, it, was, it fell to Alvin Weinberg, who, who was laboratory director from 1955 to 73, to really implement that, that vision of the lab that was integrating the fundamental and applied. Um, and in fact, it was, it was under Alvin's leadership in the 50s that the Atomic Energy Commission began supporting studies of the environmental effects of, of atomic energy at Oak Ridge. And those studies evolved in today's, into today's global climate uh, research programs. And, and Alvin himself was uh, a strong proponent of this and, and broadened the lab's environmental research portfolio uh, starting in the, in the 60s and the early 70s. And in fact, he, he was quite vocal alerting the Energy Research and Development Administration, which was the successor to the Atomic Energy Commission and the predecessor to the Department of Energy, about the dangers of CO2 buildup uh, in the atmosphere and in fact, upon his, uh, I was going to say retirement, but it was not quite a retirement. <laughs> After he left being lab director rather abruptly for reasons that are quite fascinating, um, having to do with the cancellation of the molten salt reactor, um, he founded the Institute for Energy Analysis at Orau. And um, this was really from, from 76 until 80, 84, one of the uh, centers for the studies of of the CO2 issue. And if you read uh, in some of Weinberg's collected papers uh, that have been published by the American Institute of Physics, um, there's one called the, uh, I think it's called the, the Age of uh, sustain the Substitutability, looking at uh, resource constraints uh, in terms of, you know, are there, are there critical resources that might be in scarce supply that could be a barrier to the you know, future prosperity and health of the population. And so he goes through, you know, phosphorus, iron, copper, and so forth. Um, and, and when they get to the analysis of hydrocarbon resource, um, he actually notes, and this was written in the, in the late 70s, the, the issue with hydrocarbons is not scarcity. The issue with hydrocarbons is we have too much of them. Uh, and if we liberate all of that CO2, it's going to be a problem. And, of course, this was really long before uh, CO2 and climate change was, was really at the center of focus from a science or policy point of view. So it was one of the very uh, early voices, particularly the um, explicit linkage of the energy, the energy research agenda to the climate problem is something that I think Weinberg was, was really out in front on. So... Uh, that, that as, I, as I said earlier, that really was some of the genesis of the climate change programs at ORNL today, where we're working to build a robust predictive understanding of the Earth's climate and environmental systems and to inform development of sustainable solutions to energy and environmental challenges. So uh, with, with that kind of um, 
introduction, it's now, now time to talk about our Wigner lecturer today, Susan Solomon. Uh, her research interests are atmospheric chemistry and transport in the stratosphere and troposphere, uh, climate change and its coupling to chemistry, uh, comparative studies of the environment and society. She has a BS in chemistry from the Illinois Institute of Technology and master's and PhD in atmospheric chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she w worked as an undergraduate fellow at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and completed her dissertation at NCAR where she worked on chemical dynamical model of the stratosphere and mesosphere. When the ozone hole was discovered in 1985, this model was used to examine possible explanations for its occurrence. And she's going to tell us about the outcome of her research in this area as a staff member at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration Aeronomy Laboratory. Uh, this work has been recognized in 1994. There were two geological features in Antarctica, the Solomon Glacier and the Solomon Saddle that were named in her honor. Um, that's quite a durable recognition, <laughs> although in the case of the glacier, you know, maybe not so much. <laughs> uh, in 1999, she received the National Medal of Science. She published a book in 2002 called The Coldest March, Scott's Fatal Antarctic Expedition, which compares modern meteorological data with the record, that recorded by the expedition led by Robert Scott in 1912. She's received many other recognitions, including membership in the National Academy of Sciences, a foreign member in the French and European Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and the American Geophysical Union, and a chevalier of the Legion d'Honor. I notice she's not wearing her rosette, but uh, um, all uh, recognitions of the work that she's done. She conducted research at NOAA's Aeronomy Laboratory from 1981 until 2011. Uh, between 2002 and 2008, she co-chaired Working Group 1 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and was a contributing, officer to, a contributing author to IPCC Third Assessment Report. In 2011, she was named the Ellen Swallow Richards Professor of Atmospheric Chemistry and Climate Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, this professorship is named in honor of Ellen Swallow Richards, MIT's first female graduate from the class of 1873. Um, Dr. Solomon is also the founding director of MIT's new Environmental Solutions Initiative, which is addressing interdisciplinary problems in the environment, spanning physical and social sciences, engineering, urban planning, and policy. And I gather it's also got people from the business school as well, so it really covers all the, all the gamut. Her lecture topic today is ozone depletion at the ends of the earth, a science and policy success story. Hopefully it's a kind of an illustrative example as we ch challenge other environmental um, problems. Uh, so please welcome Dr. Susan Solomon. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to visit here. It's a real honor to be able to give this lecture in, in honor of, uh, of Wigner. It's just uh, an amazing legacy that you've got going. Uh, what I want to talk about is, uh, is ozone depletion, because I think if you're going to talk about science, technology, and policy, there is probably uh, no more remarkable example in the environmental area anyway than, than this one to, to, to really show you how effectively science, technology, and policy can actually work together to solve the world's environmental problems sometimes. So I'm going to review ozone depletion history. I'll talk about that from a very personal perspective of my own uh, very fortunate life in, in this area. Um, and I will spend some time talking about how the policy was made. So I'll talk about the science, but I'll also talk in, in some detail about, about my view of the policy process, which I was privileged to witness as part of the uh, assessments that were done for the Montreal Protocol parties. And if I have time at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, ozone and southern hemisphere climate. That's the research that I'm currently doing. I may run out of time, but we'll see. Our interest in ozone, of course, has to do with the fact that stratospheric ozone is critical for life on the planet's surface. It filters high-energy ultraviolet light from the sun, which is simply not absorbed by any other constituents in our atmosphere at certain wavelengths. Uh, if we didn't have an ozone layer, we would, uh, we would basically fry, and uh, I'll talk more about what that means in a couple of minutes. 
So keeping the ozone layer, which resides between about, say, 10 and 30 kilometers over our heads, uh, keeping it healthy is, uh, is an important environmental issue. You've all heard also about uh, issues of, of tropospheric ozone, which is uh, bad for the environment. It's, uh, it's damaging to trees, for example, and it can get really ugly in situations like Los Angeles where uh, ozone can actually lead to smog. So ozone on the ground is bad. Uh, we can't compensate for loss of the ozone layer up above by increasing ground level ozone because the ecological and health impacts, the asthma that would be induced in children would just be uh, incredibly prohibitive. It's, uh, it's important to safeguard the good ozone in the stratosphere and not build up the, the bad ozone or the ugly ozone in the troposphere too much. So we have a wonderful mnemonic that will allow you to understand the distinctions between those different kinds of ozone. And I'm only today going to be talking about the good ozone in the stratosphere. So I've already mentioned its role in, uh, in, in protecting us from ultraviolet rays. What ozone depletion doesn't do is to contribute to the greenhouse effects. So people get confused by this. They think that because there's a hole in the ozone layer that uh, you know, extra sunlight is getting in and that's a, a major factor in, in global warming. That's not how, that's, that, is, that is not correct. It's a, it's a uh, common misunderstanding, but it isn't how it works. Um, ultraviolet light doesn't actually contribute much to the heat balance of the planet. So. Uh, most of the heat that, 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 that warms the surface is actually provided by visible light, like virtually all of it. So changing ultraviolet doesn't, uh, doesn't actually warm the planet, so that's, that's, that's not correct. But it is really important from a health point of view, and it's not too surprising to those of you that have been sunburned that that, that, that would be the case. What's burning your, your skin when you, uh, when you get yourself overexposed is, uh, is definitely the UV light. We have very strong studies of that, and of course if you're exposed too often, you can develop skin cancer, which uh, is, a, is a pretty scary thing. And uh, enhanced exposure to ultraviolet is also the primary cause uh, of cataracts. And as someone who's had two of them already removed, um, I take it pretty seriously to always make sure that my eyes are protected with UV uh, coatings on my glasses, as well as wear sunglasses. And of course, if it's doing those kinds of things to you, you can imagine the sorts of things that increased exposure to UV does to plants and animals. Well, the concerns about uh, the stability of this wonderful atmospheric shield then uh, really began in 1974 when uh, Molina and Rowland, two scientists working at the University of California at Irvine, published this paper in which they said, uh, that the molecules that were responsible for uh, producing chlorine were chlorofluoromethanes or chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs, as they came to be known. And they pointed out that these molecules are extremely long-lived. They have lifetimes in our atmosphere between 50 and 150 years. So the chlorofluorocarbon from your mother's refrigerator um, 50 years ago, much of it is still in, in, in the atmosphere today. Um, and uh, the, the, the key thing is that chlorine atoms that are produced from uh, the, the breakdown of the chlorofluorocarbons can react with ozone to make chlorine monoxide. That can then go on to react with atomic oxygen to make chlorine atoms back again. That's a catalytic cycle because the chlorine can go around and around and do this many hundreds of thousands of times during its lifetime in the stratosphere. So it's very effective at, at uh, depleting uh, ozone rapidly. So you just need a little bit of chlorine to catalytically destroy quite a lot of ozone. And uh, this paper has another important message, which is that you should always look at your page proofs very carefully because, <laughs> because you, just, you just never know when something that you did is actually going to win you a Nobel Prize 20 years later, and, uh, which is what happened in this case. And it was indeed published with that uh, little typographical error in it. But that doesn't stop you from getting such an award, fortunately. <laughs> Um, so in, in this case, we're talking about reactions among gas molecules only. Everything I've said is gas phase, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. Based on that chemistry, by 1985, which was 10 years after the, the publication roughly of this paper, we expected to see about, oh, I'm sorry, about a 3 to 5 percent depletion of total ozone. So the integrated amount of ozone between you and the sun is what's protecting you uh, from its rays, and so we talk a lot about total column ozone. We thought that would be depleted globally by about 3 to 5 percent by 2100 if we kept using chlorofluorocarbons at then current rates. So it was only a theory. It was far in the future. 
But then something remarkable and completely unexpected happened in a place where no one ever imagined we would see the first effects of chlorofluorocarbon-induced ozone loss, and that was the Antarctic ozone hole. So we're all familiar with this wonderful piece of what I would call big science, which is the ability to actually produce these beautiful maps of what, how much total ozone there is in the southern hemisphere, and you can literally see the hole that's been formed in the uh, Antarctic. But that wasn't the first uh, place where it was observed. The, the real, uh, I think, success story there is, is the small science that was done by the British Antarctic Survey, who'd been monitoring total ozone with a very simple instrument on the ground at their station at Halley since the late 1950s. These are the October monthly averages. You can see that it stayed pretty constant for some 20 years or so and then began to really drop like a rock. And uh, there are exceptions. There are relatively high years. They're not as high as they used to be. But basically, there's been a, a very, very dramatic depletion of the ozone layer. So there's about not a 3 to 5 percent change in a century, but rather uh, about a, a 50 percent change that, that happened in just a, a few decades. So it was totally unexpected. The Japanese uh, quickly confirmed it. I would say that in the beginning there was a lot of question about whether this thing was even real or just some kind of instrumental artifact, but it didn't take long for other instruments to be brought into, uh, uh, into uh, the argument and able to show that certainly this was a real phenomenon. So it was a tremendous challenge to the scientific community. Why was this happening? Um, maybe it was chlorofluorocarbons, but, but you know, why would it be so much faster and bigger than we expected? Maybe it was something else. Maybe it was auroral activity or changes in dynamics. There were lots of different ideas. Um, it's a little bit bright in here, so this is a bit hard to see. But uh, the, the work that, that, that I got involved in raised the question of whether or not uh, not just the gas phase chemistry, but actually surface chemistry, heterogeneous chemistry, might be important. So what my colleagues and I pointed out was that Antarctica, really being the coldest place on Earth, makes its chemistry special. It's so cold that clouds form in the Antarctic stratosphere. We don't have clouds in the stratosphere over Knoxville. Uh, you can get them occasionally in the Arctic, but much more often in the Antarctic, and we already knew that from satellite measurements that had been made. They were viewed as basically a scientific curiosity. Gee, isn't that interesting? Uh, even though the stratosphere is very, very dry, Antarctica is actually cold enough that, that clouds can form there. Uh, but but they, they changed the chemistry in a simple but, but very fundamental way that I'll talk about in just a second because you can't really see it here. Um, they allow reactions to take place that greatly enhance the ability of man-made chlorine to, uh, to destroy the, the ozone. And that's just a picture of these wonderful, beautiful, actually, polar stratospheric clouds. That's another uh, picture of them. And basically, the reason that they're so important is that the chlorine from chlorofluorocarbons gets tied up to a large extent in the lower stratosphere in these two forms, hydrochloric acid and chlorine nitrate, both of which are stable molecules. So to the extent that the chlorine stays uh, tied up there, it's in what you might call a reservoir. Uh, and as long as that's the case, the, the, the ozone layer is not in any danger. Those guys don't react with each other in the gas phase, but they do react on the surfaces of polar stratospheric clouds, according to to many different uh, measurements now that have been done on this, it's quite clear that there's a, a process where hydrochloric acid basically gets taken up on any cold, wet surface, and then chlorine nitrate can, uh, can, can react with it to make molecular chlorine. Molecular chlorine is very unstable photolytically, so as soon as the sun comes back, it'll photolyze, making chlorine atoms. Remember, I had chlorine atoms just a minute ago when I talked about Moline and Rowland. Chlorine atoms now can react with ozone to make chlorine monoxide, and in that case, the, the, the chlorine is activated for ozone loss. So the polar stratospheric clouds haven't changed. What's changed is the amount of chlorine in our atmosphere. We've uh, increased the amount of chlorine by more than a factor of five from its natural levels. We have very good measurements to show that. And so the, uh, the, 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 the polar stratospheric clouds then are sort of like the, like the potion in the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story, just uh, waiting for the chlorine to build up to the point where uh, the, the ozone loss began to be uh, very important. So uh, they, they, they activate the chlorine in a very unique way. So what that means is something like this. If you 
Uh, take a look at the amount of ozone as a function of altitude. Here's that ozone layer that I talked about. So that would be what the ozone layer would normally look like. The gas phase chemistry discovered by Moline and Rowland, very important stuff, destroys ozone very effectively in the upper stratosphere where hydrochloric acid and chlorine nitrate are not very stable. So there's enough photolysis going on up top that, uh, that, that there's a significant amount of available chlorine even without heterogeneous reactions. But the lower down in the atmosphere you go, the more stable those molecules are, so you need something else to activate them. And uh, it's the polar stratospheric clouds that do that, and they do it right in the heart of the ozone layer. So basically, in the case here where you're only sort of nibbling away at the neck of the uh, ozone layer, you only get about a 5% depletion of the total column in 100 years. But in the case where you can literally hit the ozone right where it lives, you can get a much bigger depletion right now. And that's the reason why the uh, Antarctic ozone hole forms. It's why it only forms in Antarctica, not in the Arctic. I'll show you a little bit about that later. Uh, it's just uh, the, the difference of a few degrees warmer in the Arctic is all it takes for the ozone depletion to be much less pronounced. So what it takes then, the mechanism tells you something about seasonality. In order to drive an ozone hole, you're going to need extreme cold temperatures, which you have in the Antarctic lower stratosphere right at the heart of the ozone layer, but you're also going to need sunlight. So it won't happen in the winter when it's cold but, but dark in Antarctica. Uh, it won't happen in the summer. It'll be that Goldilocks effect of the spring when you'll have still cold enough temperatures, but you'll have the sunlight returning to the polar cap that, uh, that will drive this, this very substantial ozone loss, and I'll show you that in just a minute or two in more detail. Well, I was very, very lucky to be a young scientist when all of this mystery of why was there an ozone hole uh, came, came down the, the, the pike, and uh, I had the chance to actually go to Antarctica, so I went to uh, this station, our U.S. major station in Antarctica is McMurdo Station, and uh, I just want to show you a, a wonderful picture. This is the National Ozone Expedition that I led, arriving in Antarctica around noon of uh, August in, uh, in, in 1986. As you can see, it's still very dark, so it's early in the, in the rising of polar sunrise, and uh, that was perfect timing because we were able to get there and take a look at the ozone hole forming, and uh, that's actually a picture of me. And uh, it was minus 40 degrees, and I thought that uh, I was probably the luckiest scientist on the planet to be able to be participating in such a wonderful uh, experiment as this. So my colleagues from the University of Wyoming were part of this group, and they had long experience in measuring uh, uh, ozone by balloons, and so they launched a whole series of, uh, of ozone balloons in the Antarctic, which is a bit of a logistics feat. And uh, if you look at that kind of data, here's the sort of thing you see. You can look at the ozone in, say, August, before the ozone hole gets cranked up because it's, it's midwinter, it's, it's cold, but it's still dark, and you see a normal ozone layer. But if you take another measurement a few weeks later, you're going to see something where the, these tremendous bites have been taken out of, uh, of the ozone layer. And if you come back a couple of weeks later and do it again, you'll see this remarkable depletion going on. And nowadays, by the time you get to early October, basically you have a height range from about 14 to 20 kilometers in which ozone gets driven to zero, essentially. It's, it's unmeasurable. So the uh, change in the total column is quite dramatic. It goes from 300 units of total ozone in August down to, in this case, about 112. And I think the lowest value ever is 95. So it's really a quite incredible thing. The ozone that's left is only the little bit that's below and above uh, the, the region where the depletion are, is. So it's a very, very strongly height-dependent phenomenon, and that's an important thing in proving what's going on. Uh, what we did was to go, and you can't even see it, but there's a high-power uh, LIDAR, which is shooting off beams of, of light in this picture. And taking a look at where the polar stratospheric clouds are uh, is very helpful. So you see that the altitude range, they occur a little bit at the top, top levels, but the main bulk of the layer is exactly in the region where the massive ozone depletion takes place. So there's a wonderful match in altitude. There's a wonderful match in seasonality. There's a wonderful match in latitude. It's really a fingerprint of the ozone loss. I was involved in a different kind of fingerprint, which was a spectroscopic one. Um, I uh, had uh, the, the good fortune to uh, 
t- to be able to take down to Antarctica uh, a- an instrument, one of the early spectrographs that was built uh, by my colleagues at, at NOAA, and uh, what we were able to do with it was to measure ozone itself, of course, in the visible, also nitrogen dioxide, but also chlorine dioxide. And that was really the key thing because chlorine dioxide is, close cousins to, is a close cousin to chlorine monoxide, so it was a measure of how activated uh, the chlorine had become. Um, and when we were climbing up to the roof to adjust our mirrors so that we could direct the, the sunlight or the moonlight or the skylight into our instrument, and the temperature was minus 40 and the wind speed was 50 kilometers an hour and we're standing out there playing with these mirrors like we are in this picture, um, you know, you really knew you were a scientist then. It was <laughs> pretty, pretty fun, I must say. And so some of the measurements that we made use the moon as the light source, and that's good because at night, uh, chlorine dioxide is a photolytic molecule, so there'll be more of it at night than there, than there will be during the day. And one of the cool things you can do is uh, take a look at the, at the chlorine dioxide in the column between you and the moon when the moon is high in the sky and when it's setting. And of course, the path length through the atmosphere changes enormously as the sun or the moon uh, sets. And so if it were, to the, in Antarctica, the, the moon is never going to be overhead, but if it were overhead, the path length through the atmosphere would, would be one atmosphere. And if you get to 70 degrees zenith angles, then it's three atmospheres, and by the time you get down to 80 degrees, it's, it's more like eight or ten atmospheres. So you should see a wonderful growth of the, uh, of the absorption as the moon changes its elevation. And that's what we were able to do. And here's some examples of that. So we measured chlorine dioxide column as a function of lunar angle. When we tried to do that at our home base in Colorado, we saw nothing, 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 and more nothing. All the way out to large angles, it was basically undetectable. But in Antarctica, we saw this nice progression as a function of angle, very much like what you would expect for a constant vertical column. And basically, the amount was about 100 times greater than gas phase chemistry. We did that using spectral signatures, where the laboratory cross-section would look something like the dotted line, and what we were able to measure in the atmosphere is the solid line. There's another spectral signature that we used, and another one which really got to the point where we were measuring it with remarkable uh, fidelity. So basically, it's, a, it's another kind of fingerprint. It's a spectral fingerprint that allows you to be absolutely sure you've shown that the chemistry in this region is anomalous. Spectroscopy is a great tool in the microwave as well, and uh, my colleagues from State University of New York were part of our, um, our um, uh, mission in 1986 and 1987, and they did uh, wonderful microwave spectroscopic data that allowed them to measure chlorine monoxide. And so there, were, there was a nice uh, uh, complement there of both having chlorine monoxide and chlorine dioxide. Chlorine monoxide was also measured in a beautiful airborne resonance fluorescence experiment that Jim Anderson from Harvard University and his colleagues put on a NASA airplane that flew from South America down to Antarctica. So all of this happened within the space of a few years. Other molecules that were important were also measured. So from the time when the ozone hole was discovered in 1985 to, say, 1987, you went from a situation where you first had one station measuring total ozone showing something strange, an almost complete absence of any other kinds of measurements because Antarctica was so remote. People weren't going down there to make chemical measurements on a routine basis, and there were no satellites to do anything other than measure total ozone in those days. I'll show you some new satellite measurements in just a minute. So it was very important to be able to go there on the ground or with an airplane, and that's, that was an intense period of activity uh, for, for many of us in the science community. And we were able to measure a host of important chemicals that were all related to, this, to, the, to the chemical perturbations I've been talking about. And they all pointed the same way, that certainly Antarctic chlorine chemistry on polar stratospheric clouds, or PSCs, is what was responsible for this seasonal depletion. In a way, the beauty of it is because it's a seasonal phenomenon, you can, you can do this at any time. You could go down there this year. If you'd never done those measurements back in 86 and 87, you could go down there right now, wait for the sun to come up next spring in Antarctica, which would be you know, September, um, and, and, and measure all the things you need to measure to understand why ozone's behaving as it does. So it's a, it's a tremendous lucky situation, and there I am being lucky again 
standing on the roof in the most beautiful place in the world uh, while my colleagues doing the hard work of adjusting the mirror here. I can so. So, so uh, I want to just introduce the concept of the polar vortex, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, if you look at the structure of our, uh, of our atmosphere, at high latitudes, we have a tremendous temperature contrast between uh, the mid-latitude region, which is getting sunlight and getting warmed, and the, and the high-latitude region, we're on a rotating Earth. And so what that leads to is, uh, is, is a vortex where there's a, a wind system that, um, you know, it's very much like what you're familiar with when you, uh, when, when you look at, at, at issues of, uh, of, of what happens in your, in your bathtub, you know, and the difference in behavior between the northern and southern hemisphere is something people love to, to speculate about. But the bottom line is that you have a very strong wind that encircles the polar cap in each hemisphere, keeping the air inside essentially completely isolated. So I'm sorry, here's the 100 millibar wind. And so there's your polar night jet that encircles the, the, the polar cap and keeps the air in the middle basically isolated from the surrounding air. And it's forming because of that thermal gradient on this rotating uh, sphere. And the ozone hole is, uh, is sitting in the middle of that polar vortex. And it's very much like the vortex that you've seen when you look at tornadoes or hurricanes or, or any other type of, uh, of phenomenon, or indeed in your bathtub. So now I'm going to show you some, some modern satellite data. It's taken by the Aura MLS microwave instrument. And uh, just to acquaint you with what you're going to be looking at, the white rings show the edge of the polar vortex and the inner white ring shows the, uh, the, 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 the very deep inner part of the vortex. So the edge is kind of here, and the really isolated part is there. The black ring here is showing you the edge of sunlight. So it's showing you, the for that particular day, which is May, the region poleward of the black line is all in the dark, and the vortex is more or less, it's going to move around. You'll see that from day to day it wobbles a little bit, you know, we all know about the polar vortex in America now, actually, after last year. We're going to remember, and hopefully we won't have another year like that this year. But we've been familiarized with the fact that the vortex wobbles and that moves polar air out to lower latitudes. The temperatures up here and uh, the scale here is that red is high and purple is low. Uh, so ozone starts out pretty high in the polar vortex. Uh, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, but I particularly want you to pay attention, if you would please, to the ozone and to the chlorine monoxide as we go through this uh, little movie, which is going to march through the days starting in May. So now it's May, it's still dark over the polar cap, you don't see any CLO, you see the vortex wobbling around, the ozone is still pretty high. Um, and as we go through the winter, it will, uh, and there are occasionally days when the satellite has a day to drop out, so you, this is real data, it's not a model, and it's absolutely kind of, I think, remarkable that you can generate this kind of a picture now. Notice now we got a little blob of chlorine monoxide occurring outside the black line, so it's out into the sunlit atmosphere, so there's occasionally enough of a wobble to produce a little bit of CLO at the edge of the polar vortex when the vortex wobbles outside of the dark region, as can happen. It's not enough yet to do anything to ozone because it's just it's too little too early, if you want to think about it that way. So ozone's going to just, uh, um, they're all going to just move around for a few days now. As the vortex, by the way, is getting bigger and colder. I should have mentioned at the beginning this was very small. Now the vortex has gotten very big and cold, and so... Uh, it's expanding in size. We're going through the middle of the winter. We're getting more and more on the edge of uh, CLO because now the vortex is actually even bigger than the dark region. So the region that's dark, the black line is inside the white line. And you start to see ozone depletion happening in, in sort of a, a donut. Look at that. Around the edge because that's where you've got enough light to have CLO. You're still cold but you don't have much ozone depletion inside because you're too dark. It's absolutely the most incredible film I think I've ever seen in my life. It's just magnificent chemistry and action in these movies. By the time you get to the end of August now, the, dark, the, the, the darkness has shrunk to very small. The ozone 
un, uh, undisturbed region has become very small. And of course, as we move on into September, the ozone depletion gets uh, to be essentially complete through the whole polar vortex because everybody's got sunlight now and uh, CLO is covering essentially the whole region. And I should have mentioned the, the black circle in the middle is because the satellite can't see all the way to the pole. So that's, that's just missing data. And so that's what happens. It's really quite an amazing thing that we can do that now with satellite measurements. Well, if we turn our attention to the Arctic, I'm not going to say very much about the Arctic, just in the interest of time. It's a fascinating issue in and of itself. But uh, basically, if you compare the historical data in the Antarctic in October to what we now see in the Antarctic in October, you can see the massive depletion I talked about before. Here's an example of, of kind of the most depletion that you ever get in the Arctic. There's a few years when it might be a little bit more than this, but not by much. So basically, you get a little bit of the same kind of behavior, but much, much less. And that's because in the Arctic, uh, it is generally warmer, and in particular, it warms up earlier. So the spring in the stratosphere comes considerably earlier on average in the Arctic than it does in the Antarctic. Indeed, there's never been a year in the Arctic when the stratosphere has stayed as cold as it does in the Ar Antarctic in October into April in the Northern Hemisphere. So that's why it's much, much less. Well, concern about ozone depletion led the nations of the world to do something even more remarkable, I think, than the science of, of the ozone hole, which was to agree to, oh, I'm sorry, to a Montreal protocol uh, to freeze and then phase out chlorofluorocarbon emissions. So just to be clear, um, the Montreal protocol controls emissions of chlorofluorocarbons. It's designed to safeguard the health of the ozone layer. The Kyoto protocol has attempted to control emissions of greenhouse gases in order to safeguard our, our climate. These are two completely different protocols. And uh, the difference between them actually is that this one works, and is, as I'll show you in just a couple of minutes. Um, so what would have happened to the amount of chlorine in the stratosphere as a function of time if there'd never been a protocol looks something like this. The original Montreal Protocol mandated a freeze on emissions at then current rates. So they, Countries had agreed at that point that they would not produce more and more every year as they had been doing, but rather freeze the amount emitted. And uh, what that would have led to is, is something like this curve. They got together a few years later in London in 1990 and agreed to reduce their emissions by about 50% relative to what they had been doing. And then in Bay Copenhagen and Beijing, the developing countries agreed to reduce their emissions as well. And by the time you got to uh, the more, uh, the, the, the current situation, we're following very close to the zero emission line. So production of chlorofluorocarbons has been phased out worldwide. They are no longer made, not only not in this country or in Europe or Japan, but also not in any developing nation either. China and India do not make them either. So the amount that we already have in the atmosphere will slowly decay following pretty close to the zero emission line. And if you ask yourself, how far out do you have to go before you're going to get to the point when the ozone hole will, will be definitely healed, it's somewhere out in here, around 2050, 2060, you're going to get back to the kind of levels that you had when it first started. Um, but there will be probably years when it, it begins to look pretty recovered happening within a few years because there is variability in temperature from year to year in the Antarctic just as there is in Knoxville. And so uh, the, the, the amount of ozone depletion does vary a little bit from one year to another. But the overall systematic recovery will take several decades to get rid of what's already in the atmosphere. So these are some quotations about the ozone negotiations uh, from a book by a gentleman who was a major participant in them. And uh, this is the, the quiz part of, of what we're going to do. It's, it doesn't count for a grade. So I'm going to urge you to be somewhat daring and go ahead and, and, and speculate. Um, the, the, this diplomat wrote that there was a country, we're going to call them X, who were skeptical about the theory and said, uh, well, you know, even if it happens, it won't be harmful. And that was the official government X position. And I should be clear on the timing of this. These negotiations were happening around 85, 86, 87. So um, 
right around the time that uh, before the ozone hole was discovered and then before we really had, you know, totally firm proof of its origins, but, but where there was already beginning to be evidence of its origins. Government Y was kind of similar to uh, Government X, and there was one government, we're going to call them Z, who with its allies came into every meeting and said, these molecules are damaging our environment, we must have a protocol, we must phase them out, we have to have a legally binding process for moving forward. So, can anybody make a guess as to who Government X was? It's only a theory, it's not going to be harmful. Take a guess who Government X was. I hear some people saying U.S. Okay. Who do you think was government Z? Who would have said, you know, this is bad. Let's just do something. Australia? Anybody? Chile? Yeah, you might imagine they're more affected, and you're right. Anybody else? Canada? Those are the right answers. And, you know, when I give this lecture to students, I tell them, you're probably not going to remember exactly what the chemical reactions are that are so important in activating chlorine, and you might have some idea that polar stratospheric clouds do something, but you will never forget this. I mean, this is really incredible. So it was the U.S. government and its allies that came to every meeting saying we've got to do something. The allies included Canada, Sweden, uh, Norway, and Japan. It was the U.K. that was the most skeptical and it took the longest for them to come around. The European Commission, which again was a couple of countries that we currently think of as being very uh, environmentally oriented, mainly France and Germany, that, uh, that had an attitude similar to the UK's. So um, the United States was, was the world leader in formulating the Montreal Protocol. Now, admittedly, at times we have, I think, been, been less a leader in the, in the process, particularly when methyl bromide came up. But overall, the, the U.S. has had a remarkable leadership role, particularly at the, at the start, in the fact that the world has a Montreal Protocol. So let's take a, a little bit of a look at why this happened, and I'm, I'm going to do, do as best I can to summarize it uh, very, uh, very succinctly here. A, a useful thing to look at is the number of metric tons of chlorofluorocarbons sold as a function of time. And here are those numbers for the United States, the rest of the world, and the total. And the primary producers for the rest of the world back in the 1980s were, were Europeans, uh, Germany, UK, and France in particular, a little bit in Japan. Uh, the developing countries didn't have their own capabilities. Russia had a, had a couple of plants. So there were maybe a dozen countries worldwide that were doing it, with the U.S. having, as you can see here, the lion's share well into the 70s. And then right here, around 1974, something really interesting happened, which was that the metric tons sold in the U.S. dropped, whereas the rest of the world, it, it stopped increasing its rapid rate, although it still increased a little bit. It kind of stabilized and, and then started rising again. So the, U, the U.S. decrease did not happen because the Montreal Protocol was signed. The Montreal Protocol wasn't signed until 1987 didn't happen because the ozone hole was discovered. That didn't happen until 1985, and people probably started talking about it around 1984, but, but that's much later, too. It happened because of the theory of possible ozone depletion. It happened because of that paper by Molina and Rowland and the subsequent uh, work uh, by people like the uh, National Resources Defense Council, the Environmental Defense Fund, to bring to people's attention that there was something really simple that the consumer could do which would have a big effect, which was to stop using spray cans. So literally, we're talking about in your medicine cabinet, instead of using this, using that. And uh, amazingly, at that point, the major use of chlorofluorocarbons in the United States was for underarm deodorant and hairspray. It's also, of course, these molecules are used in many other applications, which I'll talk about in, in just a second, but you know, refrigeration, air conditioning, et cetera, while important, were not the major use. The major use was this one. So the action by the U.S. consumer to, uh, to, to, to give up spray cans uh, wasn't, was clearly not a difficult thing for people, and it made what had been good business growing at a very rapid rate into what clearly was very bad business for the, for the American chemical companies. The European consumers didn't do that, and so the European market never dropped. It probably flattened out because some people, a few people did it, but the overwhelming majority of people in Europe did not do it. And as late as the late 1980s, 
about 30% of the use of chlorofluorocarbon in Europe was still for, for, for spray cans for, quote, personal care products like hairspray and, and deodorant. So I, I think the, the, the key point to, to take away from this is that uh, people's concern is, is really important, that viewpoints in different countries do change, that public opinion really matters, and furthermore, people are willing to do reasonable things. Um, this, this was, it's very similar in my, my view to things like the, the action that people take to, to recycle. Recycling is very popular in this country. People are very willing to do things that, that they understand and that make sense. There's rumors out there that, oh, no, it wasn't uh, the consumer action. It was, uh, it was things like DuPont getting ahead of the other countries for development of substitutes. Um, I, I, I know that that, that that isn't true. I think it was pretty clear that all of the companies knew what it would take to build plants to make substitutes, and they knew very well what those substitutes would be. They would be hydrochlorofluorocarbons or hydrofluorocarbons, which by virtue of having hydrogen in them are much less stable than the chlorofluorocarbons. Therefore, they last in the atmosphere only for a few years or maybe as much as 15 years, but not the 50 to 150 years like the chlorofluorocarbons are, do. So they're, they're much less damaging to, to the environment by virtue of their short lifetimes. Everybody knew that was what it was going to take. And the, the trick in doing this is, is to basically uh, put the development into to, to building a chemical plant. Any of them could have done that. It was nothing magical about some you know, strange process or unknown uh, molecules that, that somehow put the U.S. companies ahead. That is not true. But what did happen is that the U.S. consumer action made those companies willing to do something different because, let's face it, chlorofluorocarbons were a very bad business for them by the late 1980s. They had overcapacity. They didn't want to keep those plants operating. They wanted to do something different, and they were willing to change. So I think the bottom line message is that public opinion really matters and public choices really matter. Let's talk a little bit about the technology and innovation that was uh, a critical part of making the protocol successful as well. Uh, I mentioned that I, I felt really privileged to be part of the Montreal Protocol discussions on this issue. And uh, I indeed, within the Montreal Protocol, we had a science panel, we had a technology and economic assessments panel, and we had a process for, for trying to bring those two together. And uh, basically, different molecules were used in different applications. For example, in fire extinguishers, we use bromocarbons. And uh, the bromocarbons, the bromine from the bromocarbons is much more damaging to the ozone layer than the chlorine from, to, from chlorocarbons. Bromine is about 50 times more damaging pound per pound than, than chlorine is. And so that was the kind of information from the science side that fed into the technology side, looking at the, the damage levels, the options, uh, the costs, et cetera. And it was just fascinating to, to, to work with those people and learn about the sorts of things that they thought they could do in the automobile air conditioning uh, sector, in the refrigeration sector, in foam blowing, in solvents. And there was a constant interplay between the science side and the technology side in providing the protocol parties with what I would call interdisciplinary assessments of, of, of how their actions could, could, could work. And in other words, what the different policy options were. And that was, uh, I think, the, the, the essence of what made it so successful. It was the, the, the work on the Montreal Protocol, the solving of, of, of this problem, was not just a science success story. It was very much a, an interdisciplinary technology and science and policy success story. So the kinds of things that, that, that were done in sector after sector were remarkable. Lemon juice uh, could actually be used instead of chlorofluorocarbon solvents to clean electronics chips in many applications. Not all, but many. Um, Do-it-yourself auto air conditioning kits were a, a, a clear way to dramatically reduce our footprint in that sector. So uh, the fact that people would buy these little kits, you know, you could go to Target and buy one of these things and then do it, refill your auto air conditioner yourself, well, that did a lot of things. First of all, those kits were incredibly leaky, so there was an 80%, you know, just total waste um, and, 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 and also it meant that you had no incentive to really fix your system and, and get it tightened up. So, you know, you just go to Target and get another one of these things for $15 instead of spending, you know, $50 getting it fixed. Not really good for, for, for anybody. So eliminating that and having it 
having this kind of work done in garages was a, a, a very good step forward. And new phone blowing agents were found. You may remember there was a time when people were picketing McDonald's because their, their styrofoam containers that you bought your Big Mac in were, were blown with, uh, with, with chlorofluorocarbons. Um, and, you know, the Big Mac is so delicious, you're going to eat it before you know, it cools off anyhow, so you may as well put it in those cardboard containers that, that we have now. Um, talk a little bit more about uh, that vortex and some of my current work, and then I'll be able to, to wrap it up, so I should be on time. Um, I've already introduced you to the concept of the vortex, and I now want to just introduce you to the concept of the annular modes. So basically, if you take a look at the structure of the atmospheric circulation in either the northern or the southern hemisphere, what you'll find in the northern hemisphere is that it tends to be very circular, uh, it tends to be, if you will, very annular when the vortex is, is, is well developed. So we talk about a northern annular mode. It's the first DOF of the variability in the Arctic stratospheric uh, circulation and also in the troposphere. In the southern hemisphere, something similar happens. We have a southern annular mode or a SAM. And of course, as you know, they can be disturbed by these, uh, by, by these wave disturbances like the, 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 the polar vortex disturbances that we've come to, to know as we talked about before. So how does the ozone depletion affect the southern annular mode? It does something really quite amazing. Because we have so much less ozone inside the Antarctic stratosphere, it's getting now much colder um, in November than it used to get. Ozone's absorption of ultraviolet light is the primary source of heat to the stratosphere. So if you completely remove the ozone, as I showed you in the, in the profile changes, the stratosphere will get much colder, and therefore the vortex will, will get tighter. It will essentially shrink. The polar jet will move toward the pole. Um, and and that's, that's what's happened. Uh, it's uh, been a remarkable change in stratospheric climate. You don't have to have really good uh, statistics to see that, you know, if you look at the measurements at the 16-kilometer level right in the heart of, of, of the ozone hole at Halley, for example, where that total ozone measurement was made, it's gotten some 10 degrees colder, same kinds of things at all of these different stations around Antarctica where people launch balloons in the stratosphere and measure temperature uh, as, as the balloon rises. So the question that we started asking was, well, these cooling trends are extremely large. Do they have any potential to propagate down to affect the troposphere and maybe even the surface climate, or are they just confined to the stratosphere? So my colleague Dave Thompson from Colorado State University and I uh, started looking at this, and we used the balloon sound data to get the 30-year linear trends in geopotential height. You could also just use temperature and get something actually pretty similar. And if you look at that from the region around Antarctica as a function of pressure or height and, and, and time in the year, Here's the surface, here's 15 kilometers, here's something like 30 kilometers. You can see the, 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 the deepening and, and uh, uh, enhancement of the, of the strength of the polar vortex that occurs in November and December because of the ozone loss and the cooling that I just showed you. But you can also see that uh, not only does it tighten the vortex up here in, at the top side, it also over the 30-year period has tightened the vortex all the way down to the ground. There's a little bit of a time lag. It takes a couple of months for what happens in the stratosphere to get down to the ground. But basically, December, January, February, which are southern hemisphere summer, high summer, just like June, July, August here, uh, are the months when the largest changes have happened. And if you look at what this means in terms of, uh, of surface temperature trends, what I'm showing you now are the trends in surface temperature and winds for December to May, so the, the cold season, excuse me, the warm season, the summer season, um, from 1969 to, to 2000. The blue are regions where the temperature trends are of, of a cooling. You can see it's gotten colder even at the ground over Antarctica, and that's a manifestation of that shrinking and cooling of the vortex of the stratosphere working its, all the way, its way all the way down to the ground. You can see what's happened to the winds. They've gotten stronger and more circular, so the southern annular mode has intensified. What that's done to the peninsula region of Antarctica, the part that sticks out towards South America over here, is very interesting. It's bringing more maritime air from the Antarctic Ocean, which is warmer than the continental air, as maritime air always is, over the, uh, 
the peninsula. And so it's warmed this region tremendously and also warmed the tip of South America. And I'm going to talk more about other regions in just a second. If you take a look at how much of that is congruent with the southern annular mode, the great bulk of it is congruent. So you can see that there's been a, a very different kind of surface temperature change in the summer over Antarctica than what's happened in the rest of the world. Uh, virtually the whole rest of the world has warmed as a result of, of, of global warming over this period. Um, but in Antarctica, we've, we've actually had a net cooling and we've had an enhanced warming in the peninsular region. So that uh, was a, a paper that uh, I was very privileged to work on with Dave Thompson. What we've done since then is to, uh, again with Dave actually, has been to look at uh, what's going on not just over Antarctica itself, but in the surrounding regions of mid-latitudes of the southern hemisphere. So if you take a look at the 500 millibar um, temperature trends over that same period essentially, uh, and so this is from satellite data, the trend at degrees per decade in the mid-troposphere. 500 millibars is something like, you know, four or five kilometers above our heads. So it's not into the stratosphere yet. It's the middle region in between the surface and the, and the stratosphere. You can see the cooling going on over uh, Antarctica. You can see that there's related warming in the surrounding air because as the vortex shrank, that air became more mid-latitude and less polar and therefore warmer. Um, and uh, basically, it's all congruent with the SAM at that, uh, at that height level, or a big chunk of it is. So that, that all fits. And this is a paper that one of my graduate students at MIT is the lead author on, uh, Justin Bendoro. If you take a look at surface temperature, you see something rather different. And so we, struck, we sort of scratched our heads about this for many years. If you look at the surface temperature trend, okay, here's your... Antarctic cooling, your peninsula warming, and some of these other regions that are uh, also related to, to, to things like sea ice retreat on the very edges of Antarctica. Um, but, but look at the region. And so there's, there's cooling going on over big chunks of the region around Antarctica, just like you would expect. But then when you get to mid-latitudes, you see this sort of patchwork quilt of warming and cooling. And, you know, it just, it doesn't, it's not very congruent with the SAM to, to a large extent, or at least it doesn't look like it. If you look at the whole pattern, it doesn't look like the SAM. So what's going on? Um, the answer is pretty simple and pretty interesting. There's a connection to rainfall, a strong connection to rainfall, particularly in the southern subtropics. So if you've ever lived in places like uh, Eastern Australia in particular, it's extremely dry. Australia, of course, is, is, is largely desert. And so what makes the difference between a warm summer in Eastern Australia and a cool summer is mainly whether or not you get rain. And in years that are cloudy and have significant rain, you're going to have a cooler summer. In years that are drier, you're going to have a very hot summer indeed. And so in the dry interiors of the southern hemisphere continents, what matters is not just what the, um, what matters to the air temperature is, is what happens to the precipitation. So it's not just the advection of warm air, it's also the advection of, of moisture. And so when we looked at that in detail, we began to find that the region around this part of Australia has gotten wetter over the period when the ozone hole is developed. So has this bit of the, the tip of South Africa. And all of those changes have a significant uh, relationship to the change in the southern annular mode. And so that really is the, is the driver to what's going on. If you take a look now at, uh, and here's a, just a simple line drawing to be able to envision it, there's a station in the middle of Australia, very hot station in the summer, called Charleville. And here's what their December, January, February temperatures have looked like. Here's what total ozone has been doing over that period. So you can really see that there's a significant amount of correlation. It's not perfect, but uh, basically at Charleville, the ozone accounts for about 50% of the summertime intraseasonal uh, variability. Another one, Cobar, is right next to it. So that whole eastern Australia region is very sensitive to, uh, to, to what the ozone does. In a year with a deep ozone hole, they get more rain and they have a cooler summer. In a year with a shallower ozone hole, they get less rain and they have a hotter summer. And the reason is because the, the moisture flow to that part of the world is coming from the Tasman Sea into eastern Australia. And when the vortex shifts and moves poleward, 
they get less of that flow. So here's the change in the flow. It's actually pushing the air away from eastern Australia, and that's why uh, it, eastern Australia gets, uh, gets this behavior. And so what that means is that the ozone hole has essentially held back summer warming from the greenhouse gases over many parts of Australia and also southern Africa. Uh, in the recent years where we've had some years of relatively weak ozone holes like this one, we've had um, much hotter summers. And indeed, the, the, what we're currently going through is another fairly moderate uh, ozone hole and another fairly hot Australian summers. So you're going to have more and more of those years, I would argue, as the ozone hole continues to recover in coming decades. And it's not just Australia. Uh, the central part of Africa, the Namib Desert, it's the same thing. We just don't have as good data in that region. Oh, actually, I think I do have an example on this slide. So one of the other things that we've done has been to composite the summer daily maxima for high years, ozone, years when ozone is, is more than a half a standard deviation above the long-term average and years when it's less. If you do that going back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, before there was an ozone hole, the high ozone years and the low ozone years just sit on top of each other. You can't even see the difference. But if you do it looking at the recent years, you see the separation happening, and so there's a, a much uh, bigger effect in the, in the wings than there is in the, in the middle. Basically, that's the typical thing where the distribution just moves over, and it causes a big change in the frequency of hot years. And here's, so this is all Australia, this is eastern Australia, and this is one of those stations, Charleville. And uh, I can also show you the same thing for Namibia and Botswana post-1985. We don't have good measurements pre-1985 in those places, but post-1985, you see that nice separation uh, relative to what the ozone hole is doing. So I would argue that these events that we've had of, uh, of, of very hot summers in Australia recently, uh, many of them have a significant correlation to the fact that we've had some relatively modest ozone holes. So in closing, let me just say a little bit about how I think we can put this whole problem together. Um, I think the science gave us strong evidence for understanding the fingerprints of ozone loss uh, versus latitude, altitude, season, spectroscopic fingerprints of the key molecules. All of those are very important. People understood that this was a personal health issue. I mean, there are a few things I think that people fear more than, than cancer, and it's very definitely connected to that. Impacts on nature, of course, are also significant. So consumer and environmental groups were able to focus on doing something practical. Giving up spray cans was just not that hard. And that was a kickstart to what clearly became a, a major change. Industry accepted the science. I think that... Uh, in my dealings, at least, with the DuPont company, the Dow company, Monsanto, the various com chemical companies, um, you know, they've all been really interested in learning, and that's, that's been great. But the diplomats were, were skillful, and many different countries were able to see that they could participate. One of the keys to making the Montreal Protocol work was the fact that the developing countries had a 10-year grace period when they didn't have to do anything. The developed countries would go first. Um, you know, clearly by that time, the technologies that they needed would be in place, and that was uh, very, very helpful. And certainly engineering and innovation and the coupling between all of these was absolutely critical to this uh, remarkable success. And so the world has put itself on a path that uh, is clearly going to heal the ozone hole and, and probably already is. And as that happens, southern hemisphere climate, I think, should be affected. And so those are some of the key science points that I hope you'll take away, and thank you very much. Okay, so we'll go, we'll go sit down, and uh, we've got a bit of time to answer some questions, uh, so maybe I'll start by seeing if there's any, any questions from the audience. Um, yep. look at it in terms of chloral, fluoral, carbon refrigerants, R12, R22, which have been uh, phased out. If I look at their molecular weight, we're talking a molecular weight of 110 mm -hmm. for 12 and mm -hmm. about 90 for 22 right. as compared to air. So what's the driver that gets that CFC up into the stratosphere? It, 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 
How do we overcome the uh, body force term? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've been studying all kinds of heavy and light molecules in the atmosphere for a long time. And you can go all the way up to about 100 kilometers with something like, say, argon, neon, you know, pick your, pick your noble gas where there's no chemistry, different molecular weights, and guess what? The mixing ratios of all of them are, are virtually constant all the way up to 100 kilometers, and then they begin to separate according to mass. So you have to get very high. You have to get into the thermosphere in our atmosphere before you see separation by mass. And the reason is that turbulence is, is, is sufficient. Turbulence, mixing, and circulation are sufficient to move stuff around much faster than the, the, uh, the influence of, of, of mass separation can possibly act. So, you know, we have plenty of, of measurements that show that molecules don't separate by mass in our atmosphere until you're many, many, many more kilometers above the regions that are relevant here. If you take the um, global, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the cooling of the region around the Antarctic, uh, which is like 5 or 10 degrees, you said, so it looks like it. Uh, it's more like that, a few degrees. What? It's more like a few degrees. A few degrees, right. But uh, if you take that out of the averaging of the, uh, the warming of the rest of the world, is that area small enough that it doesn't have a significant effect, or is that, is that I mean, it's for a different reason than... than, than, than the uh, CO2, does that have an, a, a counter effect, or is it just pretty small? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a great question, too. Uh, first of all, this is a summer phenomenon, so it's only there December, January, February. Larger parts of Antarctica actually are warming in the winter, and so, you know, you've got other times of year that, that also are important. Um, but, you know, amazingly, Antarctica is only about 7% of the Southern Hemisphere, and the Southern Hemisphere is only half of the world. So, you know, um, it's just not enough to have a, a huge effect on the global mean. But it does have some effect. I mean, there's no doubt that, that what's gone on in Antarctica is very different from what's happening in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And had the Antarctic warmed the way the Arctic has, the global mean temperature rise would be substantially more than, than it currently is. Now, other factors are involved in that. It's not just the ozone hole that's, that's played a role there. Um, the other thing that's really interesting to think about, and it's, you can sort of joke about it and say, well, you know, uh, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents, and the Antarctic is a continent surrounded by oceans, which has a huge influence on things like sea ice retreat, right? So the amount of, by which sea ice could retreat in the Arctic, exposing more uh, warmth and you know, decreasing the reflection has, has been huge, and that's played a big role in the Arctic. You, know, just, you, don't, you can't do as much to Antarctic sea ice because but the continent's in the way. Um, but, but also, as, as you probably know, Antarctic sea ice has actually not retreated. It's expanded a little bit. And there's lots of different ideas about that. Some people have argued that the reason for the Antarctic sea ice expansion may have a connection to the ozone hole. I'm, I'm a little more skeptical about that than some of my colleagues, to be honest with you. I think that ocean temperatures and variability and circulation patterns in the ocean may be more important. But, but indeed, you know, the Antarctic is not warming. It doesn't make that much of a contribution to the global average, but, but it, is, it is different from the Arctic, no doubt. And I guess now with the sea ice, there's these recent results that say that the shelf is thinning because of the upwelling yeah. of warmer water underneath, so it's, which of course doesn't affect the continent again for the same reason you said, there's a continent there instead of water. Other questions, yep. Just wait for the, wait for the microphone so that everyone can hear. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, it seems like the evidence you um, presented at the end there for the connection between ozone hole and climate in the southern hemisphere is going to be a strong argument for geoengineering maintaining the ozone hole. I can imagine that. So what would be the negative Are you from Australia? No, I'm not. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's a fascinating uh, 
question. I haven't had that one before, so I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm a bit taken aback. But I guess what I would first say is probably the most important thing to recognize is that the chlorofluorocarbons themselves are strong greenhouse gases. They actually, when you talk about chlorofluorocarbon-12, it has a uh, global warming potential of about 10,000. So pound per pound, it's 10,000 times more damaging to, to climate than uh, CO2 is. Now, that doesn't mean that it's doing you know, 10,000 times more right now because we don't have that much chlorofluorocarbon in the atmosphere. But one of the things that's been really interesting is that the uh, phase out of chlorofluorocarbons has caused about a 10 gigaton per year drop in CO2 equivalent additions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And the Kyoto Protocol, its success, led to about a 2 gigaton per year drop in CO2 emissions. So the Montreal Protocol, very few people know this, but it's done five times more for climate change than the Kyoto Protocol actually did for climate change by virtue of the fact that the greenhouse gases themselves are, uh, are, are strong warming agents. So, you know, had we continued to emit, we would have had a very serious problem, a, a much a very substantial contribution to, to, to global warming from the CFCs. So the idea of starting to intentionally geoengineer by deciding to reintroduce them to keep Australia from getting too hot, you know, would be a little bit strange. Um, but it, the other question I think that you'd have to ask is, what about the UV impacts, not only to, say, Australia, but also to the region around Antarctica, to places like South America and New Zealand, you know, um, I don't think those areas have been, you know, profoundly damaged yet by the amount of UV, but it would be quite a decision to say that you were going to allow the ozone hole to remain present and perhaps even you'd have to grow it, right, because you want to offset, you know, what's going on with global warming agents. Um, you know, it, it, it's... It's not a geoengineering scenario that anyone other than you has ever asked me about. <laughs> Steve? I, I can probably do this without the mic. Um, all right. So both the CFCs and the uh, uh, carbon dioxide have come to the attention of the public. But I wonder if there are some other big stories out there that are known to the atmospheric chemistry community that the public doesn't know about yet. Well, I mean, everything's published, right? <laughs> we don't have any secrets. Um, I, from my own point of view, there are some really interesting molecules to think about, um, and, and they are what I'm going to call the immortal molecules. So there's a class of specialty chemical, the perfluorocarbons. Perfluoro means fully fluorinated. So you're talking about things like CF4, C2F6, where there's nothing but carbon and fluorine. And there's, there are others of, of, of that type. Um, although we don't use them in uh, significant amounts, they are strong greenhouse gases as well. And in the case of, say, um, C2F6, you know, it, it lives for, I don't remember the exact figure, but many thousands of years. So these things really are immortal. I think CF4 has a lifetime of in excess of 10,000 years, and some people would argue, you know, 20 or 30,000 years. So that's, that's, that's think about what 30,000 years represents. You know, that's when Cro-Magnon man, you know, first got going. So the whole lifetime of the human race as a race, and, you know, incredible. Um, we've introduced some of those molecules to the atmosphere. SF6 is another one. It's not a perfluorocarbon. It's a fully fluorinated, you know, sulfur compound. And we use it in things like transformers. Um, it's and also, accelerators. And accelerators. There's one down the hill. <laughs> it, also, it also has a lifetime of, of order, I believe, about 700 years. So, you know, these are things that live a long time. I think it's an interesting question. To what extent do you look carefully, a little bit specially, at those kinds of molecules in terms of what you can do? With CF4, there's a really nice success story there, which is that the main anthropogenic source of CF4 was as a byproduct of the aluminum industry. It's an accidental byproduct. You don't need to do it. And actually, a lot of effort has gone into uh, 
actions to mitigate emissions of CF4 from aluminum. It hasn't, I mean, I, I don't think my Reynolds wrap is any more expensive than it used to be, and, and yet, you know, we've reduced dramatically the emissions of CF4 from the aluminum industry. So there are things you can do to substitute for a lot of these things. But I think it's, it, there's an important overall lesson here, which is that the longer the lifetime of something is, I think the more scrutiny, personally, I think we ought to give those, those things because we're making a choice that we can't back out of very easily if we've made a mistake. I mean, this raises an interesting question, you know, the, what, what don't we know about? Um, in, in my mind, when you look at the really remarkable satellite data that you had that, that showed, you know, the, all the interactions between the ozone and the, the atmospheric dynamics and everything, um, you know, the ability to look at, you know, essentially the albedo in a spectrally resolved way, if you could do that systematically over time, you know, that would be a way where you could just sort of see you know, what's happening and then try and figure out which molecules are, are causing the problem. And, and I, I don't know to what extent that was built into the, uh, you know, never launched Earth observing sa satellite that was intended to, um, you know, monitor the albedo from a CO2 greenhouse gas point of view. But th it seems like there, there would be some satellite borne capabilities that would give you some insight into what's going on, even in the absence of a knowledge of what the actors were. And I don't know what the state of thinking is about that. Well, I mean, there are a lot of interesting things you can do with spectroscopy from space. I mean, people are doing things like, I don't know if it's being done from space yet, but, you know, looking at the health of corals, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, you can measure the color of the corals and try to figure out if they're in trouble or not from how the, how the, the, the the various spectroscopic signals look. Um, those are tough things to do. Um, you know, ecosystem health, sure, you can do things like, you know, measure the greenness uh, or, or other metrics, measure the, the, the regions that are green versus not green. Um, it, it, it's a long way, though, from actually telling you what the cause of the problem is. I mean, how, how you use that information to get at issues like, how much change in greenness is related to some sort of global phenomenon like perhaps global warming or something local like you know, some source of pollution. Smog also damages uh, trees and, and ecosystems. So you know, using that information in a way that gets at causality is, is tough, I think. Um, using it to get some measures of health really depends on how you get biologically useful spectral signatures out of the data. And, and people are starting to do that, but I think it's, it's still in its early days. Has the, uh, you mentioned that in a few years' time you should be able to really start to see the impacts of the protocols in terms of the manifested ozone hole, but you know, can, is there already indications of that, that the direction has changed there, or is it still time? There, there are beginning to be indications. I think we can say something at the global level already. The last ozone assessment was the first, actually, to make the statement that globally averaged, we can identify a, a bit of recovery. Not full recovery, but a bit of recovery. Um, and um, and that's, that's great. But locally, it's much more difficult because the variability is larger when you local changes. So I, it, when we look at the ozone issue, I think it's interesting to think about the fact that you could talk about three different stages in a sense. So you had a period when ozone depletion was getting worse and worse, so the patient was getting sicker and sicker. And then you had a period when instead of continuing to get sicker, you stabilized the patient. So, you know, it was, the, the patient wasn't better, but at least he wasn't getting any worse. And that in itself was an achievement. We've clearly gone well past that in Antarctica, for example. We can say that the ozone depletion the didn't yeah. keep getting worse, and the Arctic depletion is maybe a better metric because it was not that bad, and it has not gotten worse than it was in, say, the early aughts because we turned the, the curve on, chlor on chlorine in the atmosphere. But to get to the point where the recovery of this thing that's going to happen very slowly because of the long lifetime 
is identifiable against the the year-to-year -year variability in a given metric is very tough. We're, we're just there for global average, but we're not really there yet for Antarctica, in my opinion. Hmm. Other questions from the audience? The um, hot, dry years in Australia are often associated with ENSO. Are there connections or interactions between ENSO and the southern uh, polar vortex? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we did look at that, and it is not uh, the, the main reason in eastern Australia. Um, ENSO is really important in northern Australia. Um, but, but, yeah, and so is a confounding factor that you do have to take a careful look at and make sure that you can separate the terms. And, and we did take that into account in this work. But you're quite right. It can be very important in other places. Let's see, I think Jean was next. So you talked a little bit about uh, good and bad ozone and, and uh, bad Bad ozone being uh, formed in the troposphere and good ozone, uh, we like it in the stratosphere. Are there chemistries that are known that actually promote ozone uh, uh, increase in the stratosphere that uh, could be utilized to accelerate the, uh, the regeneration of ozone? Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion on that as well. Uh, nothing viable has been presented. I mean, you know, you, you could imagine making ozone and putting it up there, but of course the energy cost associated with that is incredible because you have to split the oxygen molecule to make the O atom and you know that, that just would be totally prohibitive. Even if you completely discount the process of getting it up there, just the amount of energy that it would take is huge. You could try to come up with ways to interfere with the chemistry. So you could for example, one of the things that was suggested was adding methane to the Antarctic stratosphere so you could fly airplanes around and release methane, and the methane would react with the atomic chlorine to make hydrochloric acid, and maybe you could neutralize some of the effect of the surface chemistry on the polar stratospheric clouds that way. It's, it's just not a viable way to go because the chemistry on the clouds is incredibly fast. It only takes about, uh, if, you, if you have... And you could sort of do a laboratory simulation. In fact, some of the laboratory work that's been done has been close to this, where you know you introduce a polar, uh, uh, an ice cloud surface or a nitric acid trihydrate surface or a liquid sulfuric acid and water surface, and you cool it down to the appropriate temperature, and you look at how fast the hydrochloric acid goes into that and how fast the chlorine nitrate hits the surface. It takes less than 20 minutes to get rid of all the chlorine. And so, you know, how are you going to compete with that? That's really the problem. It's so fast. Cloud, these clouds are just incredibly effective. So no one's come up with a, a viable way. I okay, can I see you're all a bunch of can-do people. <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> Peter, Peter was next and then Malcolm. The satellite data showed a tropical minimum, uh, and I wondered if that, that seems like a natural feature of the atmosphere, and I wondered if there's health studies that have been able to use that feature to say something about the impacts uh, that have either been experienced or avoided in the southern hemisphere. So you're talking about the fact that uh, climatologically there's less ozone in the tropics than there is at mid-latitudes? Is it, that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, it looked like yeah. the ITCZ mm -hmm. was yeah. tracking as a minimum yeah. of... The reason for that is that uh, in, in the tropical regions there's upward motion, so the air is getting uh, advected upward across the tropopause in the tropics, and it's descending as it cools in the extratropics. So that's what the overall uh, large-scale circulation of the stratosphere looks like. And so in the region of upwelling, you're bringing up ozone-poor air from the troposphere into the stratosphere, and, and that's, that's fundamentally why that happens. So it is true that there's, uh, well, there's, there's much less ozone in tropical regions than there is, say, at, at mid-latitudes because of the descent of ozone-rich air in the extratropics and the, the ozone-poor air coming into the tropics, which is all the more reason, by the way, that when you go... Uh, on vacation in the tropics, you really need to be very, very careful about your skin. Um, and you asked about biological effects. Well, quite apart from the fact that 
We've probably all experienced sunburn when we've gone on tropical vacations, and this is the reason why. Even if you did everything the same as you did at home, you would get sunburn because of, of less ozone. Uh, it, it's pretty clear that people in the tropics are darker, and this is the reason why they're darker, because they've had a genetic adaptation to that. So one of the things that you can do to look for, for example, the influence of, um, of, uh, of, of ozone depletion on, on, for example, skin cancer, is to look at skin cancer rates in people who have moved, you know. And you have to correct for other factors, like how much more exposed they may be in their new environment, but um, you know, it's pretty clear that the skin cancer rates in people who move to climates with less ozone protection are higher than they were in the home population. And the great example of that is Australia. So particularly in northern Australia, you have a population of people who's now living at, you know, 30 degrees south or something like that, say, and they used to live in England, which is, you know, 50-some degrees south, and skin cancer rates are much higher. Now, of course, the climate of Australia is really nice, and they probably spend a lot more time outside compared to Europe, but, but nevertheless, uh, you know, correcting for all of those effects, you can, you can still see a change. So it's, it's, it's not hard to, to establish that, that connection biologically. And indeed, you know, darker people don't have to worry as much about this issue, but no matter how dark or light your eyes are, you're still subject to cataracts. So you're, it, black skinned people don't have to worry about skin cancer in the same way as white skinned people do, but they still have to worry about cataracts. Okay. So could I just ask a question that's on the uh, sociological and the policy side? Um, you made a very good case that, uh, particularly in the United States, unlike the country of my birth, uh, the, the acceptance of, of, of the uh, human connection to uh, the ozone uh, problem, uh, that, that, that connection was readily accepted and, and the U.S. was then able to lead. Um, if we now look at uh, global warming more generally, uh, I think that, that currently perhaps the U.S. is probably characterized by more deniers of the science than, um, uh, than uh, most countries, or certainly Western Europe. Uh, do you understand why that is, uh, uh, or do you accept that it is the case? Uh, why is it? And what can we do, or what can be done, in order to get the kind of actionable uh, things that... Uh, that were helpful uh, with the ozone problem to the more general problem of, of, of carbon emissions? Yeah, that's a fascinating problem. I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is they are two very different problems. So I, I have to just disagree slightly with your saying the more general problem of, because they are very, very different types of problems. I think that one thing that, that, that's very helpful when you look at an issue like ozone is that people have, uh, most people sociologically and psychologically have a general concern about things that are made in the laboratory. You know, I mean, I'm a chemist myself and I, I like to, I've always gone into the lab and I, you know, but, 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 you know, things that are artificial and made in the laboratory evoke a different um, concern and a different kind of scrutiny from people just right off the bat. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the phase out of dangerous pesticides, for example, has been, you know, it's, it's been a, a challenging issue at times, but it's been one that's been largely successful globally because people don't like the idea of stuff being introduced that, that, that you know, nature didn't make. And so global warming has, has suffered, in a sense, if you want to call it that, from the fact that carbon dioxide, um, you know, is abundant in our atmosphere and that you know, burning wood is something that people have done for, you know, many, many thousands of years. So uh, when, you, when you look, though, at the, at the differences between the, the, the two sets of countries, the reason I show that slide is because it does illustrate that, that times change. So the fact that the U.K. was against the, the ozone issue and now is obviously more, many people would argue, more progressive uh, and, and that, that people have, have a psychology that's different there than here um, is, is illustrative of, of that level of, of, of change. And within this country, we've also had social change. So, you know, everybody goes in cycles. You know, you get 
one country gets into one part of the cycle or the other part of the cycle, and there are multiple sociological factors that contribute to those cycles. But you know, within this country, um, there are lots of evidence, I think, that people's views about global warming are related to the economy. And at times when the economy is, is bad, uh, we, we take a, a, a less precautionary view. So our interest level in environmental issues seems to be very, very closely tied to economic factors, perhaps more so than in some other countries. That's been a big factor recently, particularly if you look at the, the, the recent history of public opinion on global warming. The recession of 2008 and 9 had a huge influence. And now people are beginning to feel more comfortable thinking about longer term problems like that. Danny? Susan, you talked about the, the importance of eliminating CFCs from aerosol cans as being sort of low hanging fruit that really moved that debate and moved the discussion on. So here at Oak Ridge, there's a, you know, a vast portfolio of energy-related research that we do. Is there, what, is there one thing, is, you know, if you sit beside Tom Mason, the, the lab director, is there one sort of low-hanging fruit related to something in the kind of energy sector that if there could be some sort of technical breakthroughs to solve some, some problem that you would advise Tom Mason to actually yeah. try and... Well, I would be the lab. last person in the world to try to advise you guys because you do such incredible work here. Um, but I will say one thing. There's a reason why I bring this thing with me every place I go, and I've seen a lot of bottled water in this institution. What a terrible waste of resources and what a silly waste of carbon. You know, that's an easy thing to fix. And, you know, globally, there's lots of interesting estimates of how much bottled water uh, what the carbon footprint is, and it's 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 you know it's one thing if you're using bottled water because you're in a country that doesn't have clean water. We're lucky enough to live in a place with clean water. Why is a, even a half a percent of our footprint bottled water? That's what it is right now. That's ridiculous. So, my, very very minor rant there. I'm sorry. <laughs> But on the bigger question of your, your It doesn't overall... give us a good technological problem, <laughs> since I think this, this technology works pretty well. So. Yeah. And, you know, yes, there's a life cycle issue. How much did it cost to make this thing? But I've used it for a, a lot of cycles of what otherwise would have been bottled water. So um, I, 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 other than that, I can only take my hat off to you guys and say you do beautiful work on your full portfolio, and I would be the last one to try to tell you what to do differently. But get rid of the bottled water. Okay, well, I, th I, th I think on that note, we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up. And what I'd like to do to thank you is we have a little uh, memento. <laughs> a bottle of water. Yeah. Uh, it's thank a you. representation of, yeah, of Wigner. And uh, thank you for joining us. And just to let everyone know, the next lecture is going to be January 15th. Uh, the speaker will be... Another chemist, actually, Ada Yonath, who won the 2009 Nobel Prize in, in chemistry, um, and she'll be talking about uh, more structural biology, biochemistry type things. And so I encourage everyone to attend, and thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Thank you.